All right. We'll, we'll do a little Bible study tonight. And um, if you have your Bible, and I hope you have, turn to Genesis 1 and verse number 1. The first book of the five books of Moses. Remember what I said this morning about all that, the Pentateuch, the Tanakh, the Torah, the Navim, and the Ketuvim. The first book of the five books of Moses, chapter number one, verse one. The scripture says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Father, bless this holy word now to the hearing of the people, to their heart and to their soul. And I pray that you'd anoint it tonight in Jesus' name. Yes, Amen. You can be seated. Yes, you would not believe how the book of Genesis is assaulted and attacked. And there are many today in some of the biggest churches in the world who say that the story of Adam and Eve is a myth. And that it's not based in historical fact, that it's just a creation. That they are representative characters, that kind of talk. And therefore that there was never a real Adam and that there never was a real Eve. Now what they base that on is, is pulled out of the clear blue. There's absolutely no authority for that whatsoever. But that's scholarship and that's the elitist. They think they know what's best for you so they're going to talk like that. And they're going to destroy your faith in the word of God. In, the, uh, in Dayton, Tennessee in the 20s, about 1926, somewhere along in there, they had the, what's the famous Scopes Monkey Trial. And uh, there a history teacher, John Scopes, was uh, brought, in, uh, brought up before the state of Tennessee for teaching evolution. That wasn't even the subject that he taught. But he, his was a trial case by the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, and they were going to try a law in the state of Tennessee that said you cannot teach evolution. That was back when people had some sense in Tennessee. But here's the bottom line. The argument was, and now listen to this argument. This is the argument of the ACLU. Uh, Clarence Darrow was the attorney representing the ACLU and Williams Jennings Bryan was the attorney representing the state of Tennessee and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the opposition the two foes in the courthouse. Williams Jenning, William Jennings Bryan was a Christian. He ran for president of the United States. After this trial was over with, uh, William Jennings Bryan did not live long. It's been a while since I've read the material on this, but he died uh, not too long after this. It could be because of the stress that was put upon him because of the court uh, proceedings. But Clarence Darrow was uh, an attorney from, I think, up in the Northeast somewhere, very liberal. And he came into the courthouse and his whole thesis was to destroy the book of Genesis. If he could destroy the book of Genesis, then he'd establish the teaching of evolution. That was the point. It wasn't so much man against man. It was, it was, a, it was a philosophy and a theology against a philosophy and a theology. So he, uh, he came and he took hold of the book of Genesis and, William, and, and Clarence Darrow was going to destroy it. Now, the argument of the ACLU, now this is important. This is very important to understand the principle that I'm about to give you. This is very important. The argument of the ACLU then was that there should never be just one view of the origins of life. That in order for these kids to have a well-rounded education, they should be presented with two, with two views of the origin of life. Guess what? They've changed their tune. Are you listening? This bunch will use your freedom to take your freedom. You've got to understand what you're dealing with here. They come across on the surface. They present what's, uh, what, what is to be for public consumption. And they, and they spoon feed people with the idea that, they're this, that they are these upright ideological people. And that all they want is a fair shake in the marketplace. And everything's going to be okay. Not so. You're living in the age of political correctness tonight. And political correctness is shutting down the preaching. It's shutting down dissent. There is no more, there is no more debate in the marketplace uh, like they had in the Agora. There is no more debate. And so when you take debate away, then you have dictatorship and you've got one mind dictating to the people what they should, uh, what they should accept. Imagine going to the public school system tonight and saying to them, hey, hold on a minute. 
The ACLU said back in 1926 in Dayton, Tennessee, that there should be two views. What's changed? And let them stumble around and try to give you an answer. What's changed? But of course we know what's changed. It's the living word of the living God. I'm going to talk about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob tonight. There are three words that are closely associated with him that you won't find in any other context. The Holy One, the Spiritual One, and the Eternal One. He is holy, he is a spirit being, and he is eternal. These are the three words that have themes that run all through the Bible. And I'm only going to scratch around a little bit tonight like I did this morning. And we don't have the time to deal with everything specifically. But I want you to see how that the Bible begins to lay out for you a concept in the Old Testament and it's developed in the New. First of all, he's a holy God. Yeah. Second, he is a spirit being. And third, he is eternal. Yeah. Now, as you know, I've said to you before, there is no way in the world that you can define the essence of a spirit. Nobody's ever defined it for you because they can't do it. No one, not even the best teachers in Christianity, they cannot define the essence of a spirit. Therefore, the essence of Almighty God cannot be broken down and put under a microscope. This is why it says in the book of Hebrews chapter number one, that when the Lord Jesus Christ was the express image of his person, that's a direct reference back to that spirit being that is eternal, invisible, that is forever. The word person is, is what the King James translators used for us because there was no better word to use and there's certainly not a wrong word. And that word is referring to God the Father, that he, exists, he is the express image of his person. But the personhood of God the Father is still in mystery tonight. He is a mysterious being. The only way you can know anything about God the Father is what God reveals to you. You can't find him out. You can't search him out. You can't know him any other way. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the most complete revelation and definition that we can have of God the Father. Even to the point to where the Jesus only Pentecostal people are teaching people that uh, God the Father and God, uh, God the Father is a title that the Lord Jesus Christ simply bears and that the Lord Jesus Christ is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost all in one. This is why we call them Jesus only. They're wrong. Amen. There is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Amen. And they are definitely different, Amen. but they make up one Godhead. The Old Testament scripture, when we go to it, we begin to study the Old Testament. We look at the essence of God and we look at the essence of man. We see what is man. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter number one, what, are, what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou visiteth him? What are we? What are we? The Bible said when God placed the curse upon man, he said from dust thou art and unto dust thou shalt return. When he says dust to dust, ashes to ashes, that's a common phrase that has been used so many times at the graveside to try to define a man. But we have been made in the image of God. That makes us different than anything else. Amen. This God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, this triune Godhead that makes up the Godhead that it talks about in Colossians when it said in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ is all completely God of gods, yet he's the son. And we are human beings tonight. We are men tonight. We are, we are mankind tonight. That's what the word isha means in the, in the generic term. It simply means mankind. This is why the Bible said he called their name Adam. It's not that, that, uh, that, that, they are, that they are androgynous where you have a male and a female in one creature. I've been teaching you about that today. The stuff that goes on out here in the occult world. For example, Baphomet. If you've ever seen a picture of Baphomet, you know who I'm talking about tonight. He's both male and he's both female. You see this in yin-yang. You've got a circle. 
And you've got this S in the middle of it. You've got an opposing views or opposing forces or opposing elements, but they still make up the one. One is feminine, one is masculine. The yin, the yang, the male, the female, and they make up one. That's occultism. That's perversion. You are not both male and female. But if you notice the transgender movement today, just this past Thursday night when his illustrious self, <laughs> I have a hard time with him. I really do. God help me pray for me. I do. I do. When Thursday night, late Thursday night, he gave out this dictate, this fiat from the president of the United States that all schools in the United States of America. Now we're not talking about just North Carolina. There's an issue going on with North Carolina. God bless the assembly of North Carolina. But Thursday night, this man comes out and with, with fiat, with a, with a statement, with a, with a presidential directive. What do they call that thing? A, 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 a executive order. He comes out and he says that all of the schools in America are going to transform their bathrooms into transgender bathrooms. And therefore that the boys can go into the girls' bathrooms and the boys can go into the girls' locker rooms. And it hasn't been out long enough yet for the feedback. That was Thursday. A lot of people aren't even aware of this yet because they went into the weekend and a lot of times they don't watch the news on the weekend. But you mark my words. When people begin to get a hold and it begins to settle into them what this man did uh, tomorrow and the rest of this week, then you're going to see some pushback. You're going to see some feedback from people because it's no longer about it's no longer about public restrooms in North Carolina. Now they're talking about where your sons and your daughters go to school. They're talking about the restrooms in the public school system. The best thing that could ever happen for the United States of America is for the public school system to cease to exist. If you could get the federal government out of the Department of Education, you'd be a thousand times better off. Amen. 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 And so just wait, just wait and see. Now, here's the thing, folks. We have until January, what is it, the 20th, when he's sworn, they, he's sworn out and the other one's sworn in. Whoever comes and takes his place, we have until then to see what this man's going to do. What is he, what's next? What radical thing is he about now to bring down on the United States of America, folks? I've never seen anything like this in my life. But here's the bottom line. The transgender issue is an issue of mixing the gender and identity of individuals. It's causing them, even though you've got a male body to receive a female spirit, or you have got a female body, you're receiving a male spirit, what you're doing is receiving the spirit of Baphomet. You're receiving an androgynous spirit, and that's coming down on the people. That's the first thing you do. If you're going to pervert a whole generation, if you're going to pervert them, you're going to pervert them by the Spirit. The Apostle Paul said to the church at Thessalonica, if you've received a letter or a spirit as from us, the Apostle said, try the spirits. If you receive the Spirit, folks, you receive its word. And if you receive the Spirit and its word, you receive the condemnation that goes along with it. And for this cause, God gave them strong delusion. They should believe a lie and be damned who rejected the truth. Amen. Second Thessalonians chapter number two. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. Are you following me tonight? Can you see that it's right at your doorstep? Yeah. This is not something that's coming. It's here. Amen. And this is why I say buckle up. Between now and January, there's no telling what this man's going to come out with that he's going to bring down on the United States of America. It's such a shame that there's a gutless assembly up there in the Senate and the House. They ought to come out there and they ought, they, and they ought to uh, impeach him and bring him before the people. They ought to impeach him. Send the U.S. Marshals in there and say, Mr. President, you're under arrest. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? And the next state of the union, the next state of a union, union, union speech he gives, he's, he gives it from behind the slammer. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Looking through the bars, <laughs> he's home again. <laughs> Amen. Now you're in here tonight because you received the Spirit of Christ. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. If you have the Holy Ghost dwelling in you, that's because you're born again. If you have the Holy Ghost dwelling in you, you receive the Word. If you're truly born again tonight by the Spirit of God, you open the Bible and you say, my goodness gracious, that's my father talking. <laughs> I mean, it's just, look, this is my family. This, these are my people. 
That's practical, folks. This is practical stuff. A man that opens up the Bible that does not have the Spirit of God in him, he's a natural man. He may be a good man. He may be a moral man, but he's a natural man. And the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them for the foolishness to him, for they are spiritually discerned. He doesn't have the Holy Ghost, so he has no way to be able to discern the Scriptures of the living God. So the book of the Old Testament, the first book of Moses, the book of Genesis, it starts out saying the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. When you study the word spirit throughout the Old Testament, you begin to realize real fast that the Old Testament concept of spirit is not as clear cut as the New Testament concept of spirit. And the reason for that is because there's a difference between an Old Testament saint and a New Testament saint. And this, is, this, should, this should showcase to you tonight the idea that there's something about dispensations and about how God deals with men over periods of time that's different. We're not under the law tonight. We're not keeping the Sabbath day uh, like they did. You say, well, today's the Sabbath. Where'd that change? Give me chapter and verse for that. The Sabbath never changed. If you're going to keep the Sabbath, you should have kept it yesterday, starting Friday evening till Saturday evening. But if you want to keep the Sabbath, I have no right to tell you not to. According to what the apostle said in the book of Romans, if one man esteemeth another one day above another, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. I'm up here to run somebody down for keeping the Sabbath day. You're way off course when you start doing that. If a man wants to keep, but don't come along and tell me Sunday's the Sabbath. It's not. Never was. Never has been. So we're not under the law, but we are under grace. So the Spirit of God in the Old Testament, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The word for spirit in the Old Testament is ruach. That word ruach defined like this, breath, wind, spirit, mind, heart, the immaterial part of a person that can respond to God, the seed of life, spirit being, especially the spirit of God. That's what the Hebrew word means. You'll find out that Hebrew words, and this is, this is one of the things that help you understand the Bible. You'll find out that Hebrew words may have 20 to 30 different meanings. And, it has, and it's dependent upon the context of the scripture and the way it is supported throughout the rest of the scripture. That's how you interpret it in that particular scripture. You've got to watch that. That's very important. Very important. So a Hebrew word that has 20 different meanings, you've got to be careful with it. So when you read spirit in the Old Testament and you read spirit in the New Testament, be careful. Be careful. Ask God to give you wisdom to show you how to deal with what you're looking at. For example... In the book of Leviticus, chapter number 19, verse 31, regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled, defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. The Hebrew word spirit here is ob, ob. In Leviticus chapter number 20, verse 6, and the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a whoring after them. I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. Now listen to this one carefully. A man, Leviticus 20, 27, a man also or woman that hath a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Now someone comes along today, 2016, they look at that, they say, hold on a minute. How archaic. I mean, how, 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 you know, what kind of people were these people to stone people to death? Well, I don't care about seeing somebody stoned. The New Testament, we have somebody in particular who is stoned, if you'll remember, in the book of Acts, and it even names him. And he's a good example of what's going on here because it's the difference between law and grace. If you'll remember when Stephen was stoned to death, the last thing he said, the grace of God coming out of the mouth of Stephen, was, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Here they are full of hate and death and murder. And here he is full of grace and compassion and love. He's saying to them, your stones may be able to kill my body, but you can't kill what's inside here. That must have rung in their soul to hear that man that was bleeding and dying before them say, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And by the way, he had a vision too. <laughs> he looked up into the heavens and he saw the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father. Oh, how their teeth must have gnashed by watching him as he died like that. You see, grace will always overcome law. 
Grace is greater than law. Love is greater than that. It will never defeat it. Love never faileth, he said in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. Stephen was showing the same kind of compassion and love and grace toward his killers that the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross at Calvary. For the Son of God said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So here we have a warning in the Old Testament, and that is a familiar spirit. Now this familiar spirit has to do with witchcraft. It has to do with uh, mediums. Here's what the definition of the word means. A medium, a spiritist, one who communicates with and conjures ghosts or spirits. Now, I'm not, I'm not one who takes the Bible and just literally lays it out for, uh, uh, to critique the scriptures if to say these poor old ignorant uh, antiquated people, they believed in ghosts. <laughs> And it's the last time you ever checked on this stuff going on today with all these ghost hunters. <laughs> with all of the high-tech stuff out there, they're trying to find these ghosts. You'd better believe that probably the biggest majority of the American people believe in ghosts. And whether they understand what it is and what's going on, we don't know. But here's a remarkable thing. Type the word Holy Ghost into your Bible. Type it to a concordance or a Bible program or get Strong's concordance. Holy Ghost. You'll be amazed. The word does not show up in the Old Testament. Isn't that remarkable? Now, Holy Spirit does. Holy Spirit. You say, well, is there a difference? Well, yes and no. <laughs> the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost are one and the same. But there's a reason that you use Holy Ghost in one place and Holy Spirit in another. You see, there's a reason why the word Holy Ghost doesn't show up in the Old Testament and it does in the New. What is a ghost, preacher? What is a ghost? Well, a ghost is the spirit of somebody departed, right? It's the, the spirit of somebody who's gone on. I'll never forget my grandmother and my grandfather when I was a kid, man. They talked about haints. How many's ever heard of a haint? Everybody knows what a haint is. <laughs> and back then, you didn't walk to a graveyard at night alone. Now, I love my grandmother and I love my grandfather dearly, and you both, and you all know that. But they were superstitious. They were. That's their generation. That's how they grew up. And so they, they were definitely superstitious about a lot of things. But because they believed in ghosts doesn't make them superstitious. I believe in ghosts too. You better believe I do. I believe that people have contact with spirit beings. I believe that about 99.9% .9 of all the ghost experiences are nothing in the world more than demons. Yes. Amen. But the New Testament uses the term Holy Ghost because the ghost is the spirit of somebody who has died and gone on, and gone on in reference to the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Ghost coming back to you and ministering to you in this age. Amen. 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 So that gives you a big difference between Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and Holy Ghost in the New Testament. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I want you to notice something strange here in Genesis chapter number 1 and verse number 29. Genesis 1, 29. Now look carefully with it as we read it tonight. Genesis 1, 29 and 30. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree, and the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you, it should be for meat. To every beast of the field, to every fowl of the air, to everything that creepeth upon the earth. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about beast, we're talking about fowl, and we're talking about things that creep upon the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was soul. Now, in the Old Testament, there's a word for soul. It's the general word used throughout the Old Testament. That's nephesh. You've heard that before. Nephesh. So nephesh in the Old Testament makes a reference to a soul. The Bible said God formed man of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living nephesh. He became a living soul. His soul came from the breath of God. The breath of God became the soul of man. This is why man is in the image of God. This is what makes us unique. Uh, Clarence Darrow, the ACLU, the educational establishment in this country, 
Every atheist and agnostic that's ever lived hates the idea that you're made in the image of God. They'll do everything they can to tear down that idea that you're made in the image of God. Say, so what do they do that? They want you and your life, the value of your life, to be no more than that of a dog or a cat or a squirrel or whatever. They want to reduce man to nothing in the world more than a biological creature. Say, so what do they do that? One of the reasons they do that is to tear down the image of God in man and your direct relationship with the Lord. You have a connection with God that animals don't have. Another reason they do that is they're killers. They intend to reduce the population of this world. How many has ever seen these, these, uh, these uh, what do you call them? These vapor trails up here. What do they call them? Chemtrails. How many has ever seen the chem? How many has ever looked up in the sky at night and you see all this stuff crisscrossing up there? You ask yourself, what is that? Is that the vapor trail from a jet engine? No, these are chemtrails. What are they doing? They're dumping chemicals down on the people in this country. Now, immediately, they put me in the nut farm. When I make a statement like that, they say, well, that guy's crazy. Well, he's a nut job. <laughs> well, he's ready for a straitjacket. Why, who in the world? Well, you don't, you don't believe the government would do that to you, would you? Well, who did 9-11? I don't know who did 9-11, but I know this. Steel buildings don't crash like those two did unless you have controlled demolition. Some party was involved in that far more than the ones who flew those jets into those World Trade Towers. There's something going on that's not kosher. So when you look up into the sky and you see the chemtrails and you see the chemicals falling down on people, you ask yourself this question. You don't suppose that might have something to do with the fact that we've got all these kids today coming along don't know who they are anymore. I mean, we've got all of these kids today. Well, I'm a male. Well, maybe I'm a female. Well, next week I'll be a female male. Or I don't know what I am. I don't know. And you got all these women today and these men today that are breaking up their marriages and they're going after men and they're going after women. You got all these lesbians and homosexuals in the country. You got all this stuff going on. You got people losing their minds. You got people, you got people running through the streets stark raven naked. There's an awful lot of news that never gets reported over the news cycle. You don't see it. But sometimes I get emails from people all over the country and they say, Preacher, just watch this. And so I watched it. The other day I watched a thing over there in Sweden. These two women, they were sisters. They were walking in Sweden. They were, they, they were Swedish girls, and they were in Great Britain. And they were walking along the side of the, the, of the interstate over there. And it's good. I mean, here they are. They're out here walking. And the surveillance cameras are showing a very clear image of what they're doing. You know what they did? They jumped over the rail, and they ran right into the traffic. Got rolled up under the wheels. Now listen to this. Got up. And walked away. You can't say to me that there's not something going on that's demonic. Whoever sent me that email said, watch this and consider that demons are involved. And I did. And I was amazed at what I saw. And so the authorities showed up. Police got over there. They got them cornered over to the side. And one of them broke loose from the police and ran again right straight out into the traffic. Right into the traffic. And was hit again, and he called, the, he called the ambulance in the corner. He thought, for sure, she's dead, and she wasn't dead. She was able to endure beyond physical, uh, the, the, the ability of the body to endure physical uh, trauma. She could get up and go again. They put her in, they locked her up in jail, kept her in there for a while, and then because she assaulted an officer, they locked her up, kept her in there for a while. She got out of jail. She was in the community. The British community is different from America. In the, in the sense that they're in closer proximity to each other in a lot of places. She got out, she got a knife, and she stabbed a man to death. The same one who ran into the traffic. To look at these two girls, you'd think, good night, these next door neighbor. Doesn't look like anybody that, uh, that, would, that would, you know, that would cause alarm. And yet their actions, it showed still shots of their face. And you could see the terror and you could see the spirit that was coming forth from these women. Demon possessed, that would explain to me why they did what they did and how they were able to survive. One wound up in the hospital with enormous trauma on her lower sections on her legs. The other one was knocked all over the place and continued to get up and go back into the traffic and get up and go back and get up and go back. I couldn't believe what I was watching. There's a reason for the rise in what's going on in America. 
I don't know how to explain it. I can't make connections, but I can tell you this. We've had a rise in a lot of things in this country. And chemtrails, I believe, are directly connected to it. And these chemtrails have been out there for a long time. Here's the bottom line. They've even come out and said publicly that we need to reduce the population of the world. We need to reduce the population of earth in order to have the kind of earth we want. So the green agenda shows up. And the green agenda, which is the agenda that is used by the United Nations to bring about a one world government. And right now the green agenda is being pushed upon Americans and people are being sucked into this one world government. They come from every direction. Just like I told you, the Republican Party's been pushing globalism. They've been pushing these multinational corporations. People are losing their jobs. And the reason that they've been pushing, not just Republicans, Democrats too. I'm to use, the reason I use Republicans because they've sold you out. They're pushing this globalism. And the reason they push the globalism is because that's going to bring about a one world economic system. Do you remember what I said Sunday? Wasn't it last Sunday or Wednesday night? I forget when it was. Maybe it was Wednesday night. I got up before you here Wednesday night and I told you how that your eschatology, your view of last things, has a direct effect upon your view of the earth. I believe, I'm premillennial, I believe the Lord Jesus is going to come back at any time. I do not believe I'm going to change the world. I, believe, I, I do not believe that it, I'm here to, to bring about a one world religion or a one world economic system. I believe that the Lord Jesus is going to come back and catch us up to meet him in the clouds Amen. and away we go. Amen. But if you are post-millennial or amillennial, it means that your view is not on the second coming of Christ. You're not looking for the second coming of Christ. You're looking for a kingdom on this earth. You're looking to build a kingdom right here. And that's what they're doing. A lot of these people that are part of the globalist movement are good religious people. Some of these people that are part of the globalist movement are as religious as they can be and call on the name of Jesus and they pray and all of that, but their eschatology is entirely different from yours. Now, whether they're born again or not, that's between them and God. I'm the, God's the only one that knows that. He's the only one that knows truly whether you're born again. And, 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 if, you, and if you're truly born again, you ought to know yourself. <laughs> Something like that can't happen to you without you knowing it. Amen. When God moves into your soul. So you live in a time... When everything is coming down on you and you had no choice in the matter and now it is accelerating because the president of the United States knoweth he hath but a short time and what he's going to do, he's going to do it quickly. I would advise just watch him. The truth of the matter is you live in exciting times. When you see these things come to pass, lift up your head for your redemption draweth nigh. Amen, amen. So the Old Testament soul, nephesh, is used here in Genesis chapter number 1, verses 29 and 30. Notice carefully. I want to show you this. In verse number 30, Genesis chapter number 1, to every beast, fowl, creep that creeps upon the earth, wherein there is, look at that word life. See the word life in Genesis 1, 30? That is nephesh. That's the same word that is translated soul in other places and translated in many other ways. For example, a nephesh is a breathing creature, animal, or, or uh, used abstractly or uh, used very widely in a literal, accommodated, or figurative sense, bodily or mental, any appetite, beast, body, breath, creature, deadly desire, fish, ghost, greedy, he, heart, half, lust, man, me, mind, mortally, one, own, person, pleasure, Self, themselves, slay, soul, tablet, they, thing, and on and on. Are you confused? <laughs> Amen. So if I want to go find out the essence of a man, where do I go? Old Testament or New Testament? Oh. If I want to go find out what I am made out of and what I am, I go to the New Testament. Look at Colossians chapter number 2. Yeah. Colossians 2 compared that to spirit and soul that I've just given you. Now, of course, you remember what they said about this rank heretic, Paul. <laughs> I say that tongue-in-cheek, folks. You know I don't believe that. But that's what he's called. The Apostle Paul is called the worst corrupter of Christianity that ever lived. Colossians chapter number 2. 
and verse number 11. In whom ye are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in putting off what? The body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ buried with him in baptism. Oh, you say that's when I got, uh, that's when the, the, I got uh, baptized in water. Water's got nothing to do with it. First Corinthians 12, 13 says, for by one spirit are we all baptized? The Bible said in Ephesians chapter number four that there is one faith, one Lord, one what? We need to nail down what that one baptism is. There's not two. There's not a water baptism and a spirit baptism. Which one is it? That's right. For by the, the Holy Ghost. Exactly. <laughs> but here, notice carefully. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. You being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven, forgiven you all trespasses. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Never says that of an Old Testament saint. Amen. Never said it. Did you know that the Apostle Peter, when he got up on the day of Pentecost and he preached about the work of Christ and what he'd finished on the cross, he says, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. He's referring back to something that had happened in the past and he was talking about this baptism for the remission of sins. The blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. They were only pushed forward year after year after year. Well, how are my sins taken away? Revelation 1.5. There's only one way, folks. Don't care who you are, where you're from. There's only one way for your sins to be taken from you. The Bible said, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and to the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Amen. Amen. If you got a new Bible, it'll say, Loosed you from your sins. Can you lose somebody and not wash them? Yes. 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 But when you wash them, Acts chapter number 20, verse 28. Amen. Look at this one here in Acts 20, 28. This is the last thing the apostle said to the church at Ephesus. Amen. Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore to yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath done what? Purchased with his own blood. He bought you, washed you, paid for you with his own precious blood. Now I've got one more I'm going to deal with tonight. Eternal, I'm not going to say a whole lot about it. Here's what it says about eternal. Deuteronomy 33 verse 27. The eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. Matthew chapter number 19 verse 16 is the first time that eternal shows up in the New Testament. Deuteronomy 33 verse 27 is the first time it shows up in the Old Testament. Listen to Matthew 19 16 as it relates to eternal. First time, New Testament. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Matthew 25, verse 46, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Amen. In plainer words, you must be born again, Nicodemus, born of God, born of the very life of God. The new birth is literally giving you the life of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Begotten, the apostle Peter said, begotten again by a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. That begetting, there's an aspect of the begetting of your salvation that took place at the resurrection of the Son of God. You literally have the life of the resurrected Christ. Amen. That's something to rejoice about tonight. Amen. Amen, amen. 
Now I want you to notice something about the Old Testament, Exodus 3, 5. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. Holy, 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 holy ground. In the Old Testament, places are holy. The Sabbath is holy. The nation is holy. There's a holy place and a holy of holies. There's a place in the Old Testament called Kadesh Barnea. That literally means holy Barnea. Explain that. How many of you remember when they were welcome to go into the promised land? They were next to Hebron. And God said, you can go take the land. They sent in spies. God didn't say send in spies, but they sent in spies. The spies came back with a huge, two men, took two men to carry one cluster of grapes, huge, and said, yes, truly the land is great. Truly the land is blessed, but we are but grasshoppers in the sight of the people. In other words, there are giants there. You believe in giants tonight, don't you? You believe your Bible. Giants in the land. But Joshua and Caleb said we can take that land. We can do it. There is the place of decision. It's the holy place in a man's life. What does that mean, preacher? It means a place set apart. It's a place where you and God meet. It's a place separate and distinct from the profane. The Old Testament Hebrew made a big difference between the profane and the holy. You don't take the temple instruments that are dedicated to God and use them for the profane. Look what happened to Belshazzar. You remember what happened to Belshazzar? He took the implements from the temple that had been dedicated for the holy, for the worship of God. And what did he do? He drank wine to his gods. Then a hand appeared. Many, many, tikal, yufarzen, weighed in the balances. But of course he couldn't read it. It took Daniel to read it for him, the interpreter of dreams. Weighed in the balances, weighed, weighed, found wanting. Why? You had desecrated the holy. Now, please listen to the rest of what I'm saying tonight. And I'll come to a close. This is important. You have crossed the line. It's a sinner. Okay, you're a sinner. It's one thing to be a sinner. We're all sinners. He that says he has no sin deceives himself. For all have sinned. Thank God for the blood. Thank God for confession to Christ and tell him what you've done and he'll cleanse you from your sin. We know that. Amen. Amen. We understand that. But there is a line you cross. There is a difference between that which is profane and that which is holy. Holy, holy, holy to the Lord God Almighty. Listen to the Apostle Paul over here in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 2 and verse 21. Turn to Ephesians 2, 21. I'm leading you somewhere. I want you to follow with me here now tonight. You don't have to believe this, but at least look at it. Ephesians 2, 21. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy what? Temple in the Lord, right? And it becomes the habitation of God through the Spirit, right? That's what it says. It means that God's temple, which is his body on this earth, is a place where God can walk undefiled. Undefiled. So how can that be, preacher, if we're sinners? Yes, but you are covered by the blood of Christ. Built into that wall the way God erects you. Dug from the earth. Brought from the place of death. Death and earth are same. Dug out of the death of the earth. Formed and fashioned before you were ever brought to Moriah. Placed into the wall exactly as the master builder would have you placed into that wall. There's the stone. Then you cover that stone with wood. That wood represents the humanity of Christ. Then you cover that with gold. You walk into that temple of God and you have a stone wall with wood over it. You don't see that. You see gold. You see the righteousness of Jesus Christ who is made unto us righteousness. The Lord Jesus is our righteousness. So when God the Father walks into that spiritual temple, he walks into a holy place and all he sees and all he wants to see is his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you a real believer in his son tonight? Sure you are. Sure you are. If you're truly born again, you're in here tonight and you're not saying, Lord, look at me. No. 
You're saying, Lord, thank you for the Lord Jesus. Look at him. That's his deity. That's the gold. But now notice, notice. It is the habitation of God through the spirit and it is holy. It is a New Testament holiness. It is holy, set apart. Here's what that means. It means that in the spiritual world that God can walk into this house, he can walk into the midst of absolute purity and never touch this earth because you're here, you're his body, you're his bride, and he walks into holiness. Now look at the warning in 1 Corinthians. After I gave you all that, I want you to look at this warning. In 1 Corinthians chapter number, uh, verse no, chapter number 3, 1 Corinthians 3, Verse number 17. In 1 Corinthians 3, 17. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, don't jump to conclusions. Go to 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Hold your place here. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? How could that be, preacher? Well, it can be because you have been circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in putting off this body. And by doing that, have created, God creates a holy place for the Holy Ghost to reside, separate unto him. Now, that's understandable, but come back to the temple for a moment. And this is the warning, and this is a powerful statement here. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse 17. When I was first saved, let me read it again, then I'll tell you what I was taught when I was first saved. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, I was taught that that means, or that refers to you abusing your body when you, when you uh, whatever you do, you can abuse drugs, you can abuse alcohol, you can abuse a lot of things, can abuse your body. And there's no question about it, folks, that a lot of Christians have gone to an early grave because of the abuse to the body, all right? And you say, well, that's what that means. Don't think so. Don't think so. Don't think so. No, here's what I think it means. I think it means that if somebody comes against the temple of God, which the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians, you are as a collective body, his body which is holy. If they rise up against that temple, God will destroy them. That means that God will only allow so much to be done against the body of Christ. I believe that the judgment will be as it always is on everything. For him that knoweth to do good, to him it is sin. If I had not come and preached to you, would not have had sin. The entrance of thy word giveth light, giveth understanding the simple. It is that recognition of light. It is that light that comes upon the individual, and it is light rejected. That is the, that is the point. That's the point. That's the place where you come into judgment with God. You take a child, you take a child in the faith, or you take some, some young person in the world, some ignoramus that has no concept of the body of Christ, and they burn a church building down, they vandalize it, they do all kinds of things, this and that, so forth and so on, and they get away with it. They get away with it because they're ignorant. They get away with it because they're young. They get, you, nobody ever really gets away with anything, but the fact of the matter is God doesn't bring judgment upon them. But you take someone who calculates, someone who knows, Someone whose intent is to destroy the temple of the living God, which is the church of God, which is his body. That man can cross a line and cross it quickly where God will take him from the face of the earth. There's an awful lot of things that I had rather do than to persecute the church of God. Amen. That fits today, 2016. I would that every political figure in this country would listen very solemnly and carefully. Your war and battle is not against me. 
If you come against the body of Jesus Christ, it won't be me that comes after you. It'll be the Almighty. And there's nowhere to hide. There's nowhere to go. Nowhere. So that's what he's talking about. Holiness in the New Testament. And I just scratched around with a little bit of it. Holiness in the New Testament is a very powerful thing. As Elizabeth Barrett Browning says, we no longer have holy altars and holy places and holy places, uh, you know, and, and things and this and that and so forth. You've heard me say to you many times. We no longer have that. Every place you put your foot yes. is holy ground. Yes. Because you are holy unto the Lord, the holy temple of God. I give him my life tonight freely again. Yes. It's good to learn to say that. Lord, I live because you give me life. Yes. I consecrate my life to thee tonight. Yes. I'm living right now because of his mercy and his grace. And I bless his holy name. Yes. Good to tell him that. It's good to remind yourself of that. Yes. It's good to remember that we are not of our own. Yes. We, were, we didn't make ourselves, he said in Psalm 23. Yes. The Lord made us. Yes. And we give him grace and, pr and praise and blessing tonight for what God has blessed us with. We return it to him. We thank him for it. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you'd bless your word now, the hearts of the people. May they receive it, Lord. Receive it in Jesus' name. And for Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. <laughs>